and welcome to the National Transmission Planning Study Updates webinar. I am Whitney Bell with ICF and I will be your host today. I first have a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. This WebEx meeting is being recorded and may be used by the U.S. Department of Energy. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed consent to recording and use of your voice or, or image. Luckily for you, all of our participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any technical issues or questions throughout today's webinar, feel free to use the chat box and select send to host and we'll be able to help you out. We will be taking questions today, so you may submit them throughout the entire presentation using the chat function. We will then have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. If you need to view the live captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat now. Finally, we will post a copy of today's presentation on the National Transmission Planning Study Updates webinar webpage by Friday. The recording of today's webinar will be available in about two weeks, and we will notify you when it is available. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Today, you'll hear from Jeffrey Dennis, the Deputy Director for Transmission Development with the Grid Deployment Office. Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. Um, thanks for joining us today for this update on the National Transition Planning Study. I'm excited to, to dig in. But first, I want to provide a brief introduction to the Grid Deployment Office. Uh, here in GDO, uh, we work to provide electricity to everyone everywhere by maintaining and investing in critical generation facilities, expanding transmission and distribution systems to ensure all uh, communities have access to reliable, affordable electricity, and conducting analysis and technical assistance on these topics. Uh, we have three divisions that are doing this work, uh, the generation credits division, which works with existing nuclear power and hydroelectric genera generation facilities to ensure reliability and resilience and works to improve uh, electricity markets at the wholesale and distribution level and works with entities on technical assistance in those areas. The transmission division, which I'm proud to lead, supports innovative efforts in examining transmission reliability, conducting planning, uh, clean energy analysis and programs, and looking at energy infrastructure and risk analysis in support of the administration's priorities to enhance grid resilience. And finally, the grid modernization division oversees activities that help pre prevent outages and enhance the resilience of the electric grid, including grants for resilience programs, uh, grants to state and tribal energy programs, and related technical assistance efforts. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about one pillar of our three-pronged strategy for enhancing uh, the transmission grid and building out the, the national transmission system at a scale we need to meet our national clean energy uh, and climate goals, uh, ensure reliability, continued reliability, and reduce consumer costs. Those three prongs include commercial facilitation, that bar in the middle right there, uh, we have a number of tools to help support uh, transmission projects commercially, including the bipartisan infrastructure laws, transmission facilitation program, the transmission facility financing program adopted in the Inflation Reduction Act, and the grid resilience and, and innovation partnerships programs, all enacted in the bipartisan infrastructure law. In addition, we are working on transmission permitting uh, and siting programs to improve transmission siting and permitting outcomes at every level, uh, be it federal permitting, uh, state permitting, and to address impacts on local communities. But today we're gonna focus on one part of our third prong there, uh, which is enhanced transmission planning. Uh, the national, and I wanna differentiate between a couple of these things. You see the national transition planning study there, which is one part of our enhanced transition planning work. You're also going to hear an update on our offshore wind, our Atlantic and West Coast offshore wind transmission studies. Uh, but our focus today is on the National Transition Planning Study. But let me also explain why it's a little bit different than our National Transmission Needs Study. The National Transmission Needs Study, a draft of which you saw in February, uh, in which uh, we received comments on in April and we're finalizing now, 
is DOE's triennial look at the state of the transmission grid and in accordance with the directives of Congress, including most recently in the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, that study assesses where current and expected future transmission system constraints and congestion are negatively impacting consumers. To do that, the study assesses existing data to identify constraints and congestion, including a wide variety of industry studies, wholesale market pricing data, and widely available capacity expansion models. By contrast, the National Transmission Planning Study that we will discuss today is a wider aperture look at future transmission needs over a longer time period and with a wider set of potential future scenarios of demand and clean energy growth. Unlike the transmission needs study, which assesses existing data, the National Transition Planning Study is conducting new modeling to identify not just needs, but also high value solutions for customers across a wide range of potential future scenarios. I'm looking forward to today's update from our team on, uh, on this work, on the scenario development, and on how uh, and on how this work really will demonstrate the value of multi-factor long-term planning uh, to our overall efforts to build a grid that meets our future needs. Next slide, please. So you can learn more about all of the Grid Deployment Office's activities uh, on our website. I want to point you in particular to the Grid and Transmission Programs Conductor, where you can, this is a clearinghouse for all of our transmission and grid related financing programs. And here you can learn more about programs we're implementing under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and other existing DOE transmission and grid programs. And with that, I think that's my last slide, and I'm going to turn it back over uh, to you, Whitney, to introduce uh, the real smart folks who are going to walk you through the National Transition Planning Study. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you clarifying all those differences there. It was really helpful. We now get to welcome Carl Moss and Hamodi Hindi from the Grid Deployment Office to provide updates in the National Transmission Planning Study. Hamodi, I will go ahead and hand this over to you. All right. Great, Whitney. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can get that video playing later. Um, great. Let's see. There we go. All right, hopefully everyone's seeing that all right. Uh, so I'm gonna go through the first half of our presentation here that we have on the National Planning Study, and thank you, Jeff, for, for that introduction and background. Uh, so we'll first do a, a project overview. Of course, we did our kickoff webinar all the way back in March of 2022, but we'll give you all a reminder uh, what this Hamodi. project. Uh, yep. I'm sorry, I don't think you're actually sharing the screen yet. We're not seeing anything different. Oh, okay. you try that one more time. <laughs> How's that look? There it is. There. Perfect. Now we see it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll go over a project overview uh, and then we're going to focus in today on our multi-model approach. We're using about six or so different models to, to measure the multi-value of transmission. And so we're going to do a deep dive into those different types of models that we're looking at. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about timeline and next steps. And then as Jeff mentioned, we're going to pass it off to Alyssa Baker to give us a little update on how we're coordinating with those two different offshore wind studies that are ongoing. And then of course, we'll have about 15 minutes or so at the end for some uh, Q&A. All right, so project overview. So this is a collaboration between the Department of Energy Grid Deployment Office and the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And we're trying to leverage work from previous studies, including the theme study that you see a picture in the lower left uh, NREL's 100% uh, clean electricity by 2035 study, which was published uh, last year. Uh, and then uh, other previous efforts, including uh, the North American Energy Resilience Model uh, that multiple labs, including PNL and NREL, have been involved in. Um, okay, and we really have three main objectives with this National Transmission Planning Study. First, we want to identify interregional and national strategies to accelerate cost-effective decarbonization while maintaining reliability. So the emphasis really is there on identifying, as Jeff said, high-value interregional transmission expansion options. And we want to identify uh, interregional expansions that perform well over a broad range of possible power system futures. So that's really our focus in this study. 
Uh, second objective here is, well, how are we going to do that? Uh, so DOE, of course, is not going to go out and build transmission themselves. And so uh, to actually catalyze the building of intra-regional transmission, uh, we need to have deep engagement uh, with the public and, and the industry as a whole. And we feel that by doing this deep engagement and getting buy-in uh, from all the right folks, uh, that we can then catalyze the building of this high-value interregional transmission. And so we put a lot of energy into, into engaging a broad range uh, of uh, groups across the energy sector, as well as the public at large. And, uh, you know, thirdly, uh, but not least important, certainly, is we want to help inform uh, where some of the DOE funding for transmission infrastructure support goes. Now, uh, there, of course, are independent efforts uh, through the transmission facilitation program and all that. They have their own independent efforts, but hopefully the results from this study will help inform decisions where, where some of the funding might be guided to. Uh, so that's an important piece of the study. Okay. And then quickly, what is this study doing and what is it not doing? So on the left there, so what we are doing, we're linking several different types of models together to demonstrate the value of interregional transmission. As I said, it will go through about six different types of modeling that we're doing today. Uh, and we want to inform existing processes. Now, this is important. Uh, we're not looking to replace existing regional planning processes here. We, we see national planning as complementary to existing regional processes. And again, that's why that engagement piece with regional planners as well as others is so important to make sure we we complement and we add value to existing planning efforts and we'll not try and replace them. Uh, we want to test transmission options that lie outside the typical, say, 10-year planning horizon. So in this study, we're going all the way up into the year 2050, and we're exploring a broad range of futures, about 200 or so different futures, and we'll talk more about that, um, as well as looking at the resilience, the uh, coal blaze and heat snaps. And then lastly there, we want to measure the value of transmission with a number of different indicators, including economic indicators, reliability indicators, and resilience indicators to, again, demonstrate that multi-value. And then some things, importantly, that we're not doing. Uh, again, we're not trying to replace existing planning processes where it wants to complement. Uh, also, we're not going to get to the granularity of citing individual transmission line routes or get to the granularity of doing detailed environmental impact studies that you'd have to do as you develop, you know, detailed final plan service, say. Uh, and we're not generally getting as granular as the planning done by regional utilities. For example, we're not going through the full suite of uh, NERC TPL reliability standards, although we will uh, do some contingency analysis, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and then lastly, importantly, we're not here to develop detailed plans of service. Again, our goal to catalyze the building of transmission is to get engagement with the public and the industry, and then have them take the concepts that we see as high value to do that development of more detailed plans. All right. Uh, so themes from public engagement, as I said, you know, deep engagement is an important piece of this study, and we've heard a lot of feedback from the public, and we appreciate y'all's uh, attention and efforts in supporting us in the study as we work together. Uh, so we kind of have bucketed them here in three categories of, of things we've heard uh, over the last year and a half or so. Uh, on the modeling front, you know, we've We've heard recommendations to review existing industry reports uh, to help support our study. For example, the, the California 20-year transmission plan study has helped inform, inform kind of where and how much offshore wind we we're locating in some of our scenarios in the West there. Uh, we've also heard from many folks to make sure we account for the impact of climate change. And so, excuse me, Carl will talk a little bit later about how climate is informing some of the future resilience scenarios uh, we're looking at. Um, Developing actionable tools and methods and maintaining a feasible scope. Uh, of course, this is a very uh, broad scoped project. Um, and so we appreciate that feedback, right? That there's always more to do and more follow on work. Engaging as regional planners. So this was a, a big one for this study as well. Uh, we, we've had great engagement from, from the public at large as well as the technical review committee. And, and uh, we've had several deep dive regional planning meetings where we've met with groups of regional planners. Uh, we did that, several rounds of that, actually. First, we did it last September, and then again last December, and most recently this May. We, we've had uh, direct feedback from regional planners, and we appreciate their time and efforts there. So thank you. Uh, on the policy front, uh, we've received a lot of feedback from states to help us implement the, the latest and greatest state policies that are enshrined in law. So we're not modeling policies that are our goal or non-binding policies. 
Uh, so we want to acknowledge that those goals exist and, and do drive uh, decarbonization. And so in some cases, states may go further than what's shown in our models. Uh, and we're just modeling what's been enshrined in law, decarbonization targets and so forth that are enshrined in law. And uh, let's see, on the land use and environmental piece, you know, we've, we've heard frequently that permitting and siting is one of the biggest challenges in transmission planning and transmission development. And certainly we hear you there, and as Jeff had pointed out, uh, you know, another part of our office is focused pretty heavily on, on permitting and siting and, and doing more than just studies but trying to really facilitate that. And so, you know, you'll see large infrastructure build out in some of what we're going to share today. And we acknowledge that such large infrastructure build outs are, are challenging in terms of just meeting uh, permitting and site, siting challenges. And so we do acknowledge that and, and see that also as an important place to make progress. Uh, and then lastly, equity considerations. We're, we're looking at those and seeing how we can fold it into the study, looking at things like uh, energy justice and how that can fit into sort of national level transmission planning. All right, so these are the six models uh, that we're gonna go through uh, today. And so first we've got capacity expansion modeling. That's really the heart of the study and that's where it all starts. And so uh, what we're doing there it's a, a zonal model, so 134 zones across the whole country. And uh, it basically co-optimizes both transmission expansion and generation expansion together as we simulate the build out of the uh, power system from present day all the way out until 2050. Uh, and based on different input assumptions into the model, you'll arrive at a different future power system by the time you get to the year 2050. So we'll vary things like the cost of wind and solar uh, as well as uh, how much load growth you have. We have a low demand and a high demand growth in our first round there. And also how much decarbonization you might have. We, we do one set of runs where we're looking at, say, achieving 90% decarbonization on the power system by 2035 and another uh, where we're looking at 100% um, uh, by then, as well as looking at just current policies, which could potentially be a lower level. And so by varying all those different inputs, as you co-optimize the generation and transmission build out, you arrive at different power systems with different resource mixes and different transmission expansions. So we did that in the first round about 200 times, um, and then we'll take that and apply more detailed modeling. So that's what these other five models are. So we'll do production cost modeling, and that's at the nodal level using uh, industry models. Uh, as well as we'll do power flow, both DC power flow and AC power flow, and then resource adequacy. So the goal of a resource adequacy there is to check and make sure right, you have enough generation to serve the load at all times. And we're doing the traditional probabilistic based approach as well as some other approaches uh, looking at the extreme type events there. And then the stress analysis, and that's really synonymous with resilience analysis. And we worked a little bit with the North American Transmission Forum uh, looking at sort of definition of resilience. Uh, there we're looking, and Carl will talk a little bit more about that at heat waves and cold snaps and drought. Uh, to, again, try and characterize the value of interregional transmission. And then lastly, economic analysis. So, well, production cost modeling has an economic piece to it, right? You're looking at the cost of what it takes to operate the system over the course of a year. Uh, the economic analysis ties in not only that operating cost, but also looks at capital costs of those different power system features. So how much do you invest in transmission versus generation? And what are the trade-offs and what happens when you build interregional transmission, how it impacts all of that together? So that economic analysis is an important piece of what we're doing and ultimately getting to things like cost-benefit ratios. Okay, so those are the six models and, and we'll dive into them here. So this picture here uh, kind of shows again all these models together, but just as a flow chart. So on the left, you have all of our different input uh, modeling pieces on, on the resource side, as well as assumptions on the low side, for example, transportation, building electrification, as well as the network itself. Then that blue piece is the capacity expansion piece. And um, uh, there, again, we're simulating about 200 or so future scenarios in the first round. Um, and then this green piece is where we go to these other detailed models. Uh, so what's kind of new about this slide that I'll point to you is that when we do that down selection from the 200 or so features of the capacity expansion model, we're gonna down select to about three to five nodal models or nodal future systems. And it, it's pretty labor intensive to do those conversions, so that's why we're only aiming for three to five. And we'll talk more about that. But ultimately, the main goal is uh, from all this analysis, both the zonal analysis 
in the detailed nodal analysis, we want to identify, as Jeff was saying, high value transmission expansion options that perform well over a broad range of futures. Okay. All right, so again, for the capacity expansion model, um, this is kind of four different outputs of the model shown on this map uh, from our round one of analysis. And Carl's gonna talk a little bit about a round two analysis that we're gonna do later. Uh, but again, we're looking at about 200 different futures. So here's four of them shown, each different map. Um, so first of all, all four of these are looking at the high demand set of futures. So that's consistent with the net zero economy by the year 2050. And it's looking at a 90% decarbonization for the entire electric system by 2035 and 100% and by 2050, and the maps are showing the year 2050. So for these four different maps, what you're looking at that's changing is the transmission build-out paradigm. So the first one on the upper left there assumes, what if the power system develops and we really only have within-region transmission that is intra-regional, so, so no new inter-regional transmission between the first quarter 1,000 regions. Uh, how, how does the resource and transmission build-out happen in that case? And so what you see, the blue, blue dots are, are new, uh, wind, and the red dots are new solar, and the purple dots are new offshore wind. And then those little gray lines are the new transmission expansion that happens. So the thicker the gray line is, the more new transmission there is. And you can see that, that reference point in the lower left that shows the thickness of a 10 gigawatt line to get a feel for it. Um, uh, or I should say a 10 gigawatt pipe right here. This is the pipe and bubble model. We're not showing individual transmission lines. Uh, anyway, that's the upper left is assuming you don't have any new interregional transmission, only local new transmission. Then the upper right, uh, what if we do have new interregional transmission, uh, but no new HVDC transmission, so you don't have any new expansions across the eastern to western interconnect boundary or into Texas. So in that case, you see different transmission developments and slightly different resource developments across the country in terms of wind, solar, and offshore wind. And then the lower left is if uh, you, you allow not only for both of those types of expansions, but also point-to-point uh, -point, uh, HVDC. So there you do have new ties between uh, the Eastern and Western Interconnect and also into Texas. You can see there, uh, you know, thicker gray lines across the country. And then lastly, in the lower right, that's the most progressive of our transmission expansion features where you have not only AC expansion and point-to-point -point HVDC, but also multi-terminal HVDC. Um, and so you can see how, how that affects both the resource amounts and location, as well as where the transmission expansions are happening. But this is really just to show you how the different uh, systems can evolve based on input assumptions. Okay. So that was the capacity expansion model, an example of four, four of those outputs. Now I wanna dive into a couple other types of modeling, production cost modeling and the power flow modeling. Um, so for production cost modeling, uh, there we've translated over from the zonal model, which is the world the capacity expansion model lives in. And what we're talking about is about 134 zones for the whole country connected by pipe and bubble model of a transmission system. Uh, Transferring over to the nodal level, uh, which is really the, the industry model. So here we're talking about instead of 134 zones, we're talking about tens of thousands of nodes where each node can represent either a substation or even buses within a substation, as well as representation of individual transmission lines and individual transformers. And so it's a much more spatially granular model. And it's also much more temporally granular, uh, as we'll talk about. But it's, it's quite a labor intensive process to, to do this uh, trans, uh, transition to the nodal model. And so that's why we've only done it with a few scenarios. But why are we doing this uh, transition to the nodal model? What do you gain? Well, as I said, by modeling those individual elements, you can get closer to reality in terms of modeling actual limits and actual constraints of the system. And so there's value there. Uh, and also we can gain insights into grid balancing using more granular uh, spatial and temporal model. And for the temporal granularity, what we're talking about, you know, the capacity expansion zonal model, it's got roughly 17 time steps per year, and then we simulate every three years going out to 2050. Uh, on the other hand, this nodal model, right, we're doing simulation in the production cost of 8,760 hours in a single year. So you can really see within that single year uh, what are your challenges during different seasons, and then even within seasons, what are different challenges in different weeks or even uh, across the course of a day, for example, say a sunset in California where you've got that ducker. 
you can really see uh, the challenges uh, and constraints that the system might face there. And then, of course, on the spatial side, when we've got individual lines modeled, we can see in much more detail where are the local constraints, right? If you're adding one or two gigawatts of wind to an area, how does that impact, you know, not only the interregional system, but the local system? What are local reinforcements you need to be able to get that power out of there to where it needs to go? And so we've gained a lot of insight there by having these more spatially granular models. And then lastly, I'll point out, right, in terms of the generator interconnection, right, we have to actually choose interconnection points that are specific to, do we want to put it at a 230 kV substation versus a 500 kV substation? And so that's just another piece that you get when you look at uh, these more detailed nodal models with that higher spatial granularity. Um, and so I think I covered basically these points uh, on the previous slide, but again, we're going to post these slides so y'all can feel free to, to read back through these these points here about the benefits of, of the, um, the nodal model. And, uh, and then the grid balancing insights, I think I covered most of these there on that a couple slides ago. Um, although one thing I'll point out on this grid balancing insights, and here uh, the picture you're seeing is the production cost modeling simulation zoomed into a particular week in the month of January. And it's an hourly granularity, but you can see sort of each day, like where the, the load peaks, that black line is, is the load and then wind and solar in blue and yellow. And you can also see when we have this uh, more temporal granularity where exactly curtailment is happening. And that's uh, the gray piece of the graph. That's sort of the highest pieces of the graph towards the beginning and end of the week. And by having that temporal granularity, we can see more how often the, the curtailment is happening and what's causing it. And of course, with the spatial granularity, individualized models, you can see, well, there's a local constraint that might be driving curtailment. In that case, interregional transmission isn't going to help you until you fix that local constraint. And so by having these detailed nodal models, we can see that. And actually, one of the adjustments that uh, we've made to our models as we go into round two of this analysis is uh, we saw that uh, there are a lot of local constraints impacting some wind integration. And so we decided to increase uh, the cost assumption for local network reinforcement and for wind integration as we move to round two of some of this analysis. And so those are some of the insights we gain with these more detailed models. All right, so here's a nice video uh, that the very smart folks at our labs have, have put together for us. What you're looking at is a particular month uh, in August, a particular day in August, I should say. So it's a 24-hour period that keeps replaying over and over at an hourly granularity. And this is the power system out in the year 2035 where what you're seeing here is new resources and new transmission added. Um, and so on the resource side, the yellow dots you see appearing are solar. So the brighter the yellow dot is, the more solar generation is happening over the course of the day. So it disappears at night and it appears strongly in yellow in the day. And then uh, the blue dots are new wind resources that we've added and again. The stronger the blue dot is or the darker it is, the more wind generation is happening at that particular hour. And then the last thing you can see in the resource side are pink dots, which are batteries that we've mostly co-located with solar. So you can see as the solar goes away, it's sort of the batteries lighten, lighten up as they sort of spread that solar energy out into the evening. Um, and then on the transmission lines you're seeing, these are the new transmission expansions. And the darker the line is, the more heavily it's loaded. So you can see as the lines change color, how their loading changes over the course of this 24 hour period. And what you see nicely here is, you know, the complementarity of some of the complementarity, I should say, between the solar in the east and the wind more in the center of the country and how the resources shift, those transmission line loadings change over the course of the 24 hour period. Okay. All right. Uh, so diving a little bit more into the zonal to nodal translation, there really are three pieces with it. So again, we're starting with this capacity expansion model where we looked at these 200 different futures and it's 134 zones. So how do we map that to a model that has tens of thousands of nodes and, and, and you know, thousands of hours of simulation per year? Uh, so first we take the load and the generation and we try and as best we can do a one-to-one -one mapping. So whatever resource makes the capacity expansion model predicted, we try and map both the magnitude and locations as best we can to the nodal model. And on the load side as well, right, we, we do the similar mapping 
of course, trying to spread the loads out over, over those thousands of nodes, right? That takes effort, certainly. Um, and then there's the transmission mapping. So there, we're not trying to do a one-to-one -one mapping of the expansion that the capacity uh, expansion model predicted. There, we're, we're doing a lot more analysis and sort of engineering judgment and, and using capacity expansion partly as a guide to inform what we're doing, uh, but also uh, there's a lot more analysis that goes into how much transmission expansion and where to do it at the nodal level. Uh, we're not just mapping the capacity expansion model, uh, transmission expansion. And so really how, how we do that is uh, we start by uh, running an unbounded production cost model flow so, so we don't enforce line limits. We let the power flow where it wants to flow to be an economical optimum. In that case, you're going to have transmission lines overloading, of course, in the model, but we ignore that just to get a feel of where the power would flow if it weren't constrained by transmission. We look at that and try and make the things about, okay, well, based on that, it makes it sense to expand transmission this much over here and maybe this much over here. And then we'll do what we call a semi-bounded production cost model run. There we're just enforcing certain parts of the system uh, to help gain more insight into where expansions are needed and to also get a sense of potentially impact of uh, resource curtailment uh, and how those could be potentially fixed by expanding the system in certain places. And then lastly, we, we try and do a what's a fully constrained production cost model run where we're uh, enforcing transmission limits uh, for the whole high voltage system, 230 and above, and, and seeing how the system performs there. And then, of course, that entire process is iteratively repeated. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So here's kind of in words uh, what I was saying, so I'm not going to read through all these again, but again, the slides will be posted, so you feel free to go through this level of detail. Um, uh, the last thing I want to say about the nodal transmission expansion approach uh, is it's iterative, as I, as I said, but also there's an important piece where we actually are doing some DC contingency analysis. And so I, I really want to highlight that because so many national studies uh, uh, kind of overlook uh, contingency analysis just because of the scope of it. And so we are, as, as part of this nodal transmission expansion planning process, doing you know, not only the n minus zero run to see where constraints are, but also DC contingency analysis. And it gets on the order of a magnitude of about a thousand or so contingencies, uh, looking at you know 50 to 100 different production cost model snapshots. So that gives you the sense of the magnitude. And then we're using that to help inform where we expand the system at a nodal level. So it's quite involved. And um, all that's to say, though, right? We're still not doing the level of granularity. That, uh, that a utility would do an expansion process. We're not running all the NERC contingencies. So we're not here to define a final plan of service. And also these particular implementations that we're doing, it's one of many possible implementations of a sort of higher level interregional expansion concept for a particular future. So I want to caveat, caveat that. All right, so that's the method. Now let me get to some uh, examples here of actual output. So we're going to zoom in on a particular scenario that assumed interregional expansion, but only AC interregional expansion, so no new ties across the interconnect. And um, we're going to focus on the year 2035, and again, that's high demand future, so consistent with the net zero economy by uh, 2050, and 90% decarbonization by 2035. So that's kind of the power system we're going to look at here uh, for some illustrative output. So first, let's look at the capacity expansion model. Uh, what happens when you go from the present day power system to this particular high demand 90% decarbonized system in the year 2035? Well, first of all, the generation capacity increases and you can see that in the upper right of bar chart. So in 2020, today we have about 1100 gigawatts of nameplate capacity installed. And to get to this uh, high decarb 2035 system, uh, the model is saying, well, we need to more than double that and get to about 2,400 gigawatts. So it's quite a large infrastructure build out just in terms of resource capacity. You can see in the blue and yellow, a large portion of that is wind and solar. Of course, we still have uh, in purple quite a bit of gas there, you can see. So that's the uh, resource capacity. And then in terms of energy, uh, what's happening, so that lower right bar graph, Today, we we're at about 4,000 terawatt hours per year in terms of energy. In this high demand future, by 2035, uh, you know, we're getting to about a 50% increase in terms of annual energy demand. 
there going up to close to 6,000 terawatt hours. And then lastly, the transmission system itself uh, on the left side, you know, today's system about 160 terawatt miles and we see going up to 2035 here about a 40% increase and that's just in the interregional transmission build out. That's not accounting for uh, radio lines to connect generation or local network reinforcements. And as I said, you know, we found, especially in this nodal analysis, that you do need a significant amount of local reinforcement to accommodate these, these transformative features that have a large amount of resource addition and, of course, a large amount of load growth as well. Okay. So um, that's kind of the system we're looking at. Now, what does the zonal to nodal translation look like? So first I want to focus on the eastern interconnection, which you see shown here. So on the left, there's our capacity expansion model that I was talking about, again, 134 zones for the whole country and connected uh, by a pipe and bubble transmission model. So first, the, the green you're, sh you're seeing there are new transmission expansions that the model is saying that uh, we should have. So the thicker the green line, the more transmission expansion uh, there is. You can see especially connecting sort of the center of the country to the eastern load centers this is where most of the transition expansion is happening. Uh, and then on the resource piece uh, for the capacity expansion model on the left there, again, the, the yellow dots are solar and the blue dots are new wind. And the larger the circle, for the larger the, the power plant is or the larger the number of power plants are in a particular area. So you can sort of see the resource location across the country there for this particular feature in the capacity expansion model. Now, when we map this over to the nodal model, which is shown on the right, you see, again, the resources are in the same locations and same magnitudes because we're, we're doing as best we can a one-to-one -one mapping there. Um, but the transmission, you still see a lot of transmission going sort of uh, connecting the center of the country to the eastern load center there. Um, but here what you're seeing is uh, the different colors of lines represent different voltage classes, so 345, 500, and 765 kV. Um, and the solid red lines, for example, represent new double circuit 500 kV lines, and the dashed lines are, are single 500 kV lines, uh, new lines that we've, we've put in as one particular nodal implementation. And again, we have to do some sort of particular nodal implementation in order to get the model to run to do the production cost analysis and other detailed nodal analysis. But we want to caveat, we're not saying that this is the quote unquote correct implementation. Right? It's one of many possible nodal implementations for the particular uh, system shown there on the left. Um, and you can also, it's harder to see, but the purple, you see expansion sort of in the PJM area, 765 kV system uh, as well. So that's the eastern interconnection. And then lastly here, the western interconnection. Again, on the left, you see a particular capacity expansion model uh, of the system in the year 2035 for this 90% decarb system with a high demand. Uh, and then on, on the left, you can, or excuse me, on the right, uh, you see the nodal implementation of that, but where the resources are located, again, the, the yellow solar and the blue wind dots, and the new resources, as well as the, the mostly red and green lines you see, the new 500 kV and 345 kV expansions uh, happening. Uh, so that kind of gives you a flavor for, for what happens when we do the uh, zonal to nodal uh, translation. And I'll just cover a couple quick takeaways and then pass it over to Carl here. Uh, you know, so firstly, as I was saying before, right, these nodal implementations aren't intended to be a final plan of service. They're just one particular implementation of many possible nodal implementations for a particular power system future. Um, but what we've seen in these, though, is that uh, there are robust trends in, in resource and transmission expansions observed across a broad range of future scenarios particularly for the capacity expansion model over the 200 or so features that we simulated, we see continuing trends of, of a need to expand transmission, for example, from the center of the country towards the eastern low centers is one of the trends we saw. Uh, but also continued trends in really large amount of wind and solar growth. We've made that point in earlier webinars, but um, even as we vary assumptions and availability of technology and costs of different technologies, uh, we see these trends continue. Um, so that's encouraging. Uh, third takeaway there, um, you know, we were able to successfully transfer over these really transformative uh, changes to the system and get them to run on industry-grade industry detailed models. Um, 
And so that's also encouraging, right, that it is possible to successfully model really transformative power system features and using these very detailed models. Um, and then the last point here on this slide uh, is just that we've seen, of course, uh, if you have a broader interregional view of transmission expansion, uh, that those types of expansions really can have significant impact on what type of regional local planning you do, as we see both the need uh, for, for local reinforcement to accommodate large, say, local resources that might be driven in part by interregional connections, um, as well as just changes in resources mixes generally and transmission generally, uh, depending on whether or not you uh, have a lot of new interregional transmission. Uh, and then kind of this last slide of takeaways here. Um, through these nodal models, right, we've seen also how much curtailment can happen in, in various places. And again, we've seen a need for, for local reinforcements to help prevent some of that curtailment so that we can deliver the energy up to the main grid so it can get to where it needs to go. Um, for example, one thing you saw in the picture of the Western interconnection, there was a new backbone build out in Montana to, to collect all the wind that was going in there. And so we've seen that often a new collector backbone is needed to help deliver new renewable energy to, to the main grid. Um, and then the third thing here, so nodal modeling, one of the things that's helped us do is, is learn how to improve our, our zonal model. And so, for example, I, I made that point of we, we saw that really there's a lot of local network reinforcements needed, and so we've made adjustments to the, the local wind integration costs uh, on our zonal model to account for, for that. Um, Let's we'll see, new insights for technical uh, feasibility uh, using these multiple models. So again, this is getting to this idea of these nodal models have both more spatial granularity and more temporal granularity, and they, they better model the, model the physical limits on the system. And we can also gain grid balancing insights there uh, with these more granular temporal models. And then the last piece I'll, I'll leave you all with is really we're trying to build tools that can be leveraged by industry. Again, DOE is not looking to build transmission directly themselves. We want you all to be able to leverage these tools and do more detailed studies that, that ultimately hopefully will lead to, to transmission expansions that get put in the ground. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and pass it to Carl. And uh, oh no, oops, one more slide before I pass it to Carl. Actually, okay, this is an important piece, AC power flow. Um, so as I said, we're doing DC power flow contingency analysis to help inform our nodal transmission expansions that we're doing. Uh, we're also doing some AC power flow analysis. So, so Pacific Northwest National Lab has developed a tool called CPage, the chronological AC power flow automation, automated generation tool. And that takes basically a power flow snapshot, excuse me, production cost modeling snapshot and can automatically convert it over to an AC power flow uh, snapshot and why is that important? Well, when you have an AC power flow, you're representing reactive power flows, which has an impact on line loading and also has an impact on, on uh, allowing you to analyze voltage stability, uh, see how the system performs there. And so we've been able to convert over you know, hundreds of cases from hundreds of power production cost model snapshots and do some analysis there. So I did want to point to that. All right, here we go. So now I'll pass it over to Carl, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, control back, uh, and he'll talk about a few other models here. Great, so I'll advance now to that point. Hopefully, I'm not making people too seasick. Um, so again, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, again, my name is Carl Moss. I'm a senior advisor with, with, with GDO. Um, I'm really pleased to be back with you all for this third in a series of our webinars. Um, back in October, we touched on many of the themes that we're talking about today. Um, so this will serve partly as a, a reminder, but also to give you all an, an update on some of the key outcomes um, that we've seen along the way and give you an update on what, what tools we are using. Um, as was mentioned, the heart of this effort is our scenario analysis, and the core tool um, for this analysis is the capacity expansion model. So I'm going to be speaking um, briefly about our next round of our capacity expansion modeling to give you a sense of where we're headed this fall. Um, our, our scenario analysis asks, what are the different ways the grid might evolve? So as was mentioned, we've co-optimized generation storage and transmission um, given a series of input assumptions and 
constraints, such as carbon uh, system constraints and goals. Um, for, all, for all of these future systems, um, we'll be looking at the interaction across various sensitivities and then picking some of them to perform more detailed production cost modeling, power flow, which you just heard about, and resource adequacy analysis, which I'll speak to briefly. And then we'll be doing some economic analysis on that work. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, so for the expansion, for, for, for the uh, capacity expansion modeling round two, um, we have a number of updates that we've done as compared to the work that we shared with you last October. I'll just highlight a few. Um, so for the temporal work, uh, while the previous model looked at 17 time slices, what we found through the work that we did this winter, uh, we would really uh, benefit from a more granular modeling approach. Um, what we saw from the more detailed hourly modeling is that we could benefit, get better insights if our capacity expansion modeling could, could be more granular. Um, so we now have 33 representative days and 30 stress period days at four hour resolution. So that increases our time steps to 378. Um, so that's a considerably more detailed modeling effort that we're doing, requiring more, more computing power. Um, but we think we're, we're gonna get a lot from that. Um, also, just to highlight our transmission network reinforcement costs, um, which was already mentioned a little bit earlier today, um, we used to have a more uniform network reinforcement cost assumption um, based on what we've seen both from literature, from looking at the results from this winter, we, we felt that we would benefit from having a spatially varying uh, re reinforcement cost. Um, and so in some cases that will raise the cost for certain wind generators for getting into the system that we think will more accurately represent what we're gonna see in the future. Um, the last one I'll highlight is our demand projections. Um, and so we've been working with uh, states and getting input from various states around the country to learn better about what demand forecasts they are assuming and how those are being used both within PUCs and, and within the various planners in the state. Um, and we've been doing up updates uh, to that information. Um, and then we've also, while well, we did preview in October the impact of the federal IRA, so the Inflation Re Re Reduction Act, it's now incorporated um, into all of our scenario work. Um, so now moving on to the next slide, 34. I want to talk a little bit about our transmission paradigms, and we have a couple of slides here. Um, these are the same paradigms that we shared with you last October. Um, we have a limited case, which is really our counterfactual, um, and it's focused on only allowing intra-regional, so looking at expansion within each of our main regions. Um, and what we've done in limiting it, and the blue text highlights some of the small changes that we've made versus October, uh, we're looking at annual transmission additions of less than 1.1 terawatt mile per year. And that's really based on the historical data that we've seen looking at large transmission buildouts in the country. Um, so it, it both serves to teach us of what um, could be considered a flat business as usual, but also gives us a, a counterfactual to be able to compare against our other three paradigms. Our so-called AC transmission case is largely unchanged. Um, and this is where we focus on intra interconnect so we have three interconnects, West, East, and ERCOT, um, and we focus on looking at AC expansion within each of those. Um, and so that leverages the work of our capacity expansion model, which is 134 zones, and looks out how we may see AC expansion within those interconnects. And then the uh, next two paradigms allow for high voltage direct current, HVDC upgrades, and we look at two different examples of that. And again, these are illustrative paradigms. We're not forecasting that the system will evolve um, in any of these, but what we hope to gain is insights from each of them to help inform where are the best opportunities. And so the first one we've now called P2P, which is point to point. We're looking at allowing inter-interconnect, so allowing us to connect east and west and connect ERCOT with east and west, um, and to, to, to be able to use those high voltage DC lines um, and what we've done is we've looked at over two, or roughly 200 candidate interregional lines of how HVDC could run, um, and we've been limiting it to less than 1,000 miles. So we've been looking at fairly long lines and looked at a large opportunity space to help map, map out how we might uh, model those P2P scenarios. And then the last one is really looking even more expansive at a multi-terminal HVDC platform. Um, and so this is where we allow for not simple point-to-point, -point, but allow for off-ramps and on-ramps within that HVDC 
platform. So we've taken those four paradigms and then we've layered onto them as we did in the fall, um, different assumptions around how load will grow and to, to what degree will we, we will decarbonize the grid. And so um, for those two variables, we now have a three by three matrix. So we've added an, an additional set of load growth. Um, before we had a high low bounding and now we have a low medium and high. Um, and so there have been some changes to, to, to those assumptions as well. Um, for the high demand, we're still framing that around a net zero economy by 2050. Um, so that includes a significant amount of, of electrification to, to get the uh, full economy to a zero net emission. Uh, for the low, it's still focused on a business as usual load growth. And the, the um, uh, medium by its name is a less aggressive than the high growth scenario, but does include the impacts of the IRA. Um, and so with that, we have our four transmission paradigms and then we multiply that by our three by three uh, matrix to develop these 36 core scenarios. And just as we presented again in the fall, we're then going to do additional sensitivities on those. Um, and so what we've done is looked at this diagonal of the three de demand and emission scenarios. And so we take our four transmission paradigms and focus on three of the, again, the uh, current policy low demand the 90% the and medium demand and then the 100% high demand and look at those and multiply them by 12 different sensitivities to give us 144 different views of what the future might be. Um, and we highlighted some of these previously, but just to run you through them quickly, we're looking at sensitivities around lower wind costs. Um, we're also looking at uh, lower solar and, uh, and, and battery costs. We also want to pressure test the cost of carbon capture and storage. Um, we've been looking also at variables that might hinder the growth. So looking at limited wind and PV siting. So we put a, additional constraints on where we can site wind and solar and, and uh, see what those impacts are. We also want to test out what if we have more limited options in terms of technology. So what if we don't have carbon capture and storage? Uh, what if we don't have hydrogen available? Um, what if we don't have new nuclear available? Um, so this will give us additional insights into how the future might play out. And then we layer some of them in what we call our many challenges. So if we have um, a more difficult time siting solar and wind combined with not, uh, an inability to have new nuclear carbon capture and hydrogen and combined with climate change impacts, um, what does that more challenging future look like? And what is the benefit of transmission that we see um, in, in those circumstances? Um, so that's the quick overview of our round two. And again, we'll be um, embarking on that work towards the end of summer, and we'll be looking to come back in the fall to share some, some of the results. Um, so now I want to do a very quick view um, in the time left on a couple of the other parts of this multi-model approach. Um, so first, I want to give you an overview on, on our resource adequacy work. Um, so this slide just gives you some high-level definitions. For those who, who don't know the term resource adequacy, um, is a process in which we look at the supply of electrical demand and how it's being met at all times, taking into account system outages. So how are we able to meet our, our demand needs even when we have a contingency that's being applied to the system? Um, and the traditional method is we look at a, a prediction of when will the system peak. That's our, you know, our most uh, 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 stringent time. Um, as we think about other futures, there will be other hours that we need to also look at. When might we have uh, lower wind and lower sun? Um, but a, a traditional first approach is to look at system peak. Um, and then we use specialized tools to help estimate the amount of extra capacity the system will need above that peak. So we call our planning re reserve margin. Um, and it's that reserve margin that we need that allows the system to deal with system outages that um, might occur. And then we build our a system around those needs. And that's what this illustrative graph shows you that we have in the dark gray, what the actual peak is, there's a planning re re reserve margin above it, and then we build resources to, to help us meet those needs. Um, so in our natural transmission planning study, um, we've, we have our capacity expansion model reads, um, and it builds the required firm resources to equal or exceed that peak demand plus the planning reserve margin. And REED doesn't just base this on nameplate capacity, but looks at how will each resource be available in the hour when we need it. Um, and so we then verify the work of this capacity expansion model REEDs using other tools. 
um, that are able to model the system um, and verify that we are indeed adequate. Um, and one tool is called PRAS, our probabilistic resource adequacy suite. Um, and we also use a number of different production cost models to help us verify that we have an adequate system. And we found that for futures of low carbon power systems, and we demonstrated this in the fall and reaffirming it now, um, including those with you know, greater than 75% variable renewable shares, we can meet resource ad adequacy needs with proper planning. Um, we've evaluated adequacy um, in a more complex way as well. Um, and what we found is that you know, we, we need to carefully examine stressful periods given the fact that we'll have a system which has a much higher degree of, of variability and uncertainty in, in, our, in our supply. Um, and supply impact adequacy, but so does a change in the demand shape as we see from increased electrification. And a changing climate must also be considered um, to understand the impacts on our, on our resources and the shape of, 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 of that demand. Um, so what we've done for round two is we'll be using an updated approach um, based on what we've learned from our round one, in which we'll integrate PRAS, our probabilistic tool, that dynamically in the capacity expansion model read. Um, and so that's what we are able to incorporate now um, in a more thorough way, looking at stressful periods to identify um, when, when, we'll have, you know, when we'll have key periods of hourly uh, dispatch out of PRAS that are going to be challenging for the system. Um, we directly model network flows and, uh, and storage operation during those stress periods and can identify periods of inadequacy due to energy limitation. Um, and so these are significant upgrades that the labs have been working on over this year and we will be implementing as part of our round two. So um, with that transition, I want to talk a little bit about um, additional work we'll be doing to look at stress analysis. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways that studies have defined stress. Uh, for this particular study, we're focusing on, on uh, weather patterns and uh, weather impacts that we can um, look at global climate models, which I described last October. Um, and what we see is there will be increasing heat waves. I think many people in the country right now are experiencing some of those impacts already. Um, so we do think it's really important for us to explore and expand on uh, not just what we've seen in the past, but how these heat waves will become more intense in the future. We'll also be looking at, at cold waves. Um, we've seen some more extreme cold as it can move its way through the country and want to understand that, and then also drought. Um, and so the types of impacts that we'll be seeing from heat and cold is they will have a direct impact on load. So for example, heat waves will increase our needs for cooling in buildings, and we'll see higher peak loads during those time periods. Um, we'll also see the impact on our supply. Um, and so what we've seen from heat waves is that um, it can have an impact on air density, um, and that can affect wind resources and wind generation. It also, hotter air temperatures will affect our conventional thermal generation fleet, um, and both will decrease our, our, our supply. Um, the heat also has an impact on transmission capabilities, and we will be explicitly modeling that as part of our stress cases. Um, and so just to give you a quick overview of kind of how we want to split uh, this up and test out some, some new tools, as I mentioned, we have very detailed atmospheric simulations that allow us to look at what might a future climate look like. Um, and we have that affect both load modeling as well as our resources, so thinking about the impacts on wind and solar generation and our um, hydropower plants. And then we translate that into two different levels of our modeling suite. So we'll be looking at, at the zonal level at a probabilistic resource adequacy using PRAS. We'll also be looking at the nodal level using our, our production cost modeling platforms. And so some of the outcomes that we expect to see are um, analyzing loss, loss of load probability for the entire U.S. Um, and looking also at specific uh, regions as we see heat waves coming through. Um, and this, this considers a broad set of combined weather and infrastructure um, uptime uncertainties. And so through our, our, our zonal analysis, we will be able to combine in kind of an annual look over time different levels of heat waves and cold waves and, and see those impacts. We're also going to be looking at more fine grain, so looking at individual days and weeks through our, our, our nodal analysis and really demonstrating some brand new methods. Uh, we'll be starting by looking at certain regions 
um, to demonstrate that we're able to gain actionable and, and, um, and useful insights, and then we'll be able to, over time and into the future, expand these tools to, to, to look at other regions. So we'll be looking at unserved energy um, at the nodal level um, with this higher spatial resolution, and we'll be able to really see how the system is coping um, and what the value of this extra transmission is going to provide us um, as we face some of these hotter and colder extremes. And so this just walks you through a quick example, looking at the kind of uh, at our, our nodal work and some of the methodology. So what we've done is we've looked at historical heat waves. So this is an example over the course of a year where we see peak um, in the middle of the summer during that heat wave. So we expand that and look at that full week and see what the, the peak load is on the system. And we can model that in our production cost tools, but we won't stop there. We won't just look at our historical peak data, but then we'll layer on climate scenarios. And that's what these additional colored lines show that as we look at different probabilities of outcomes of different climate impacts, we see in many cases, they will be increasing the heat and therefore the, the, the level of our peak load. Um, and just to give you a breakdown of that, what, what this final graph shows you is the percent difference in load between our climate impact scenarios and our business as usual heat wave. And so you can see that, you know, we, we have certain periods where we could see 20% increase in our peak load simply because our future climate is, is going to more than likely than not give us more extreme heat to have to contend with. Um, so that's a quick overview of our stress analysis. Um, what I'll now pivot to is talk a little bit about what we're going to do with some of that work on our economic analysis. And this is still underway. Uh, we don't have any outputs to share with you today. So this will be a little bit of a refresher of what I described for you all in October. Um, so our approach here, again, is, um, is multifaceted. We want to leverage our multi-model platform. Um, so we'll be leveraging our capacity expansion work, our production cost work, and our resource adequacy work. You see we've called out zonal production costs. Uh, we will be also doing economic analysis based on some of our nodal data, but the core of our economic analysis will leverage our zonal PCM work, and that's because that gives us um, a much broader set of data to be able to look at, more scenarios to analyze over many more years. Um, and so we, we leverage those, that, those three different modeling platforms to help us draw out data around capital costs. So what are the avoided generation and transmission um, investments that, that, that might be made? We look at operating cost changes. How are we avoiding using fuel and what is the value of that? How are we avoiding the cost of uh, uh, unit cycling in the more detailed PCM work. We look at the reliability impacts um, when it comes to the, to the economics. So what's the reduced cost of ancillary services? Um, and what do we look at the, re the reduced loss of, of load probability uh, that will come from the different paradigms of, of uh, our transmission expansion? And then finally, uh, looking at resilience, which is really new work in, in, in the literature that our, our, our labs are beginning to dig into, is, you know, if we see a reduced duration of outages, what is the economic value of that? Um, and if we see, again, reduced outages during those extreme events, how can we look at, at least at the first stage, qualitatively describing it and then exploring methodologies for how we can quantify those benefits? So with that, that's the very quick run through our uh, multi-model approach. I did want to close out this part of the presentation with a, a refresh on our timeline, which we've shared this slide with you all before. Um, so, as was mentioned previously, we kicked this off over a year ago, um, and we have completed our initial round of, of scenario modeling. We brought that work forward to you all in October. Um, we've been doing much more detailed analysis over the winter and have learned quite a bit to refine and build into our round two. Um, and then what we see in the box is our meeting with you now today. Uh, we will have a meeting with our TRC, who's our technical re re review committee, um, and they will be reviewing and giving us feedback in the fall. And then our plan is to come back at the end of year and share with you the, the results of our round two findings. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, we hope that you all will be able to come back and, uh, and help to learn with us as we see what we've found from our round two work. So with that, I will close out and turn over the mic to my colleague. Thank you, Alyssa, for joining us. Thank you, Carl. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Hamodi. Um, so I did want to jump in here and just introduce Alyssa Baker. 
She's a Senior Technical Advisor for Offshore Transmission with the Grid Deployment Office. Alyssa, I can see you. Can we hear you? All right, great. Uh, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys all for having me today. I know um, offshore doesn't always get talked about with the NTP and all of the national transmission work onshore that's going on, but I'm here to assure you that those pieces absolutely do fit together. They absolutely are working together behind the scenes. Um, and in case you haven't been involved in some of our offshore work, uh, I'm going to give a quick summary of that today just to fill you in a little bit, and then uh, we'll see how the pieces fit together. Next slide. So um, the offshore, thank you. Uh, the offshore work that we've been doing has been in partnership with BOEM. So unlike the onshore transmission study, this has really been a joint agency effort. Um, we've been tasked to look at both the Atlantic and the West Coast, and we'll be shifting to the Gulf pretty soon. Uh, but we're looking at not only the transmission analysis uh, that we have going on the Atlantic and have just started on the West Coast, but we're trying to look at all of the, the policy and the economic questions, things that the analysis may not tell us or may not tell us definitively. Um, as well as hosting conversations to bring relevant stakeholders, state leadership, tribal nations, impacted parties, ocean co-users, everybody to the table to have a voice to talk about these important issues because transmission has a huge impact on us that we don't always see it in our daily lives and it, it has an impact on the power prices that we pay as well. So uh, we've been doing a lot of convening work. For the Atlantic in particular, um, we ran a, a huge series of workshops last year, uh, bringing together a bunch of experts to talk through these various topics and then bringing in the preliminary information from the transmission studies uh, that were happening concurrently. Those have been packaged together into an action plan that I'm really excited about. Uh, if you've heard me talk earlier, I probably told you it would be published in the spring or early summer because it turns out that getting multi-agency concurrence on a, a series of actions as broad and detailed as these are takes just about as much time as getting the good ideas to begin with. But I promise we are nearing the end and I'm, I'm excited that we're going to have publication pretty soon and, and, and more information there. But uh, enough of just the offshore, let's look at how it kind of fits into that national planning work. Next slide. So I like to say that, uh, you know, the West Coast study and the Atlantic Coast study are siblings. They're, they're not identical twins, but they're they're very closely related. And the National Transmission Study has got to be like a cousin because they're definitely familiar, uh, but they're not exactly the same. So some of the things that are absolutely shared, you know, the study teams have a lot of overlap. We have a lot of the same technical experts looking at both um, studies. They're communicating regularly. They've got check-ins scheduled to talk through things, work stuff out. Um, they're sharing a lot of the same assumptions. A lot of the same underlying assumptions that go into both studies are common so that we can have a common frame of reference when we're talking about results. And they're using a lot of the same modeling tools. So. You know, they're not asking the exact same question. Not every scenario matches between the two, um, but we are making sure that these studies exist in the same universe of plausibility so that they can be useful. Um, one of the most, one of the things I think is most interesting to pull away from that is the use of the points of interconnection data. So, you know, a lot of the coastal work we have been doing in the offshore space involves identifying optimal onshore tie-ins. And those points of interconnections on the shore is something that can be used into the NTP um, for the nodal modeling. Uh, I think there's also, you know, there's been some talk about using the interregional topology that came from the Atlantic study as one of the nodal scenarios um, for the NTP. I think the team is still working on that, but uh, rest assured that these are very well coordinated, um, but they are answering slightly different questions, so they're not they're not redundant. So I think that's kind of the, the basics. Uh, stay tuned absolutely for more from our offshore stuff. That'll be coming pretty soon with the publication of the action plan. Uh, and of course the NTP has uh, another public webinar that Carl just mentioned coming at the end of the year where we'll have even more information to share. Back to you, Whitney. Great, thank you so much. All right, this brings us to our Q&A portion. So we are going to, um, be bringing all the different people who have spoken today up here for to answer some questions. And while we're doing that, 
I want to make sure that you know you can ask questions. Please put them in the chat and we will um, try to get to them as best we can. So as we're bringing up the speakers, I am going to go ahead and get started here. So I'm going to get started here with a question first for Hamodi. Hamodi, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so does DOE intend to incorporate large interstate independent transmission projects that are under development? If so, how and with what criteria? Yeah, yeah good question. So, uh, you know, first of all, as we said, Sort of during the presentation, right, that these particular nodal implementations that we're building of these future power systems, um, they're just one of many particular implementations. And so uh, certainly we don't want to uh, choose winners and losers in terms of actual individual transmission line developments. There, there are many possible futures there. Um, so that said, as we do these nodal implementations, uh, we, we have surveyed sort of which projects are in development and in more advanced stages of development and, you know, if certain proposed projects that are in advanced stages of development are, are lining up with some of the, some of the transmission expansions that we're seeing uh, as part of our modeling effort, you know, we may potentially use those in some of the implementations uh, of, the, of the model. Um, and so we, we've discussed in, in previous meetings, I think, different criteria that we use to potentially look at those. Uh, so while we are looking at those, and, and potentially using some of them in some of our implementations. You know, I want to emphasize that uh, any of the implementations that we're doing here are not intended to be final plans. Uh, they're just one of many possible implementations. We want to identify high-value interregional transmission at sort of a higher level. Um, and so, um, you know, with, with many possible different future implementations that, that can be decided. It's, um, by industry and as part of other processes that DOE has in terms of evaluation of projects. Uh. Thank you. Um, so I do have another question here, and this one's for NREL, and it's a couple of questions that are kind of related, so I'm going to ask both of them. Um, and just so our attendees know, we do have um, some staffers from NREL and from PNNL that will be joining us here on the screen uh, to answer some questions here. So this question is, with resource capacity, I assume the study is looking at nameplate capacity. How would the analysis change if accredited capacity levels were studied? And the related question is, what capacity accreditation for wind and solar are you applying for 2035? Yeah, thanks, Whitney, and hi, everybody. My name's True Bai with the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I'm kind of representing kind of the large technical team here um, on, uh, for, for the labs in, in this question. Um, so first, in terms of the question, resource adequacy, uh, Carl touched on this a bit. Um, it's obviously a key component of reliability, and so we obviously need to, uh, you know, analyze it and make sure the systems and the portfolios that we're putting out there uh, are truly resource adequate. Um, so in fact, the modeling, um, the full suite of models, but especially the, the front end where you have the capacity expansion models that generates your portfolios, does consider resource adequacy um, by looking at different accreditation for different technologies that vary by region, depending on the characteristics of the underlying resource, um, as well as with scenario and over time. Um, so that's a dynamic part of the model that's calculated. For the final version of the scenarios, um, we are incorporating the probabilistic resource adequacy suite, or that PRAS model, um, which does draw on outages and does a Monte Carlo analysis within that portfolio design framework. Um, so we are calculating that um, within the model to answer the second part of the question in many of these high renewable scenarios with lots of wind, solar, and battery storage. Uh, we do see the marginal contributions from these resources going down to near zero. Um, however, um, the interplay with transmission and, you know, the fact that the first uh, sets of technologies that are deployed still does contribute to uh, firm capacity or resource adequacy needs. Hope that helps. Back to you, Whitney. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is actually for Carl. So as we're bringing him up here, um, Carl, this study seems to depend on development of certain generation resources. 
How useful would this study be if different kinds of generation are actually built, nuclear instead of land-based wind? What if new forms of generation are developed? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, so I'll maybe reemphasize some of the importance of the work of doing sensitivity analyses. Um, so, you know, we all know that uh, making assumptions for 30 years is incredibly challenging. Um, and so given that uncertainty, what we've asked the labs to do, um, and they've been able to gather quite a, a significant amount of stakeholder input over these months is to test out different technology assumptions. So at the core, they've made a number of technologies available and allowed the model to look at what is at least cost optimized outcome. But we recognize that those assumptions, you know, may not be right. We may get the cost of wind the next 30 years wrong. We may get availability of nuclear wrong. So we've tested, pressure tested availability through our scenarios. And that's where we have the nearly 200 different sensitivities that we'll be running this fall um, to give us insights into what are the implications of certain technologies are or aren't available. What if it's harder to cite wind? Um, and at the end result, how does that affect um, these outcomes around our interregional transmission builds? So one of the core questions for us at DOE is, when we look at all of these sensitivities, which transmission opportunities continue to be beneficial? So we're not just looking at one particular generation profile and saying, let's build transmission around that. What we want to be able to do is understand which transmission opportunities are, are robust to a suite of different future outcomes. Um, and so it's, it's through this different multi-model approach that we'll be able to answer that question, looking at different generation outcomes. Um, and clearly there will be new breakthroughs into the future. And so that's why this process can't be once and done. Um, we really are looking for this type of national transmission effort, this national planning effort to continue into the future. Um, and so this is about engaging with our various public entities and, and private entities and moving forward and learning from what we do this round and then doing it again as we see new technologies coming forward. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Carl. This next question, um, there's two of them that are related and this is gonna be for PNNL. Uh, are there any considerations of the stability need of such high penetration of IBRs and the moving of generation further away from the load centers? The related question then is, has system stability been assessed or considered? Yeah, thank you, Whitney. Uh, excellent questions. Uh, as, as everybody is, is familiar, the inverter-based resources or IBRs uh, do behave a little bit differently than uh, synchronous generators and, and can contribute to uh, stability questions that, that need to be addressed. The first step is really looking at the power flow analysis. And so when, we, when we're done with the capacity expansion and the, the production cost modeling and looking at the resource adequacy, and the hourly uh, profiles will we'll take some specific cases, some, some stress cases, run some power flow analysis, do contingency analysis on those. And really what the power flow analysis can reveal are things um, you know, like reactive power and voltage support and some of those steady state types of uh, considerations that we can model in the power flow and look for whether or not these uh, resources are, are providing those types of ancillary services. Uh, really to fully answer that question, we need to get into the dynamic analysis to look at things like voltage stability, uh, transient response, inertial response, those types of things. Those are currently outside the scope of what we're doing on the transmission uh, uh, planning study. So uh, um, some, of the, some of the analysis we're doing, some of it's out of scope. Great, thank you. All right, so this one is for NREL. What criteria is being used to cite the new generation and new transmission? How is the existing grid limitations being accounted for, overloads, et cetera? Is the impact to the short circuit cap capability impact to protection systems, system inertia, and essential reliability services being considered? Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Um, it's a great question, and um, we probably don't have time to go through all the details, but I'll try to provide a high-level summary right now. Um, which is, in terms of determining which resource mix and where to put the technologies, um, the model tries to account for as many characteristics of the technologies and needs of the system um, simultaneously and balance those. 
Um, so for example, back to the resource adequacy question, um, if a technology uh, isn't able to contribute as much to its uh, the system needs during a stress periods, either other technologies might become more economical or you'd have to build more of that technology or connect it with storage or with transmission to other systems. So it's doing this holistic approach for system planning altogether. And that applies regionally as well. Um, so the first question was about siting uh, renewables. Um, and so it does account for the differences in technology costs, uh, resource availability, um, higher capacity factors in one region or another, proximity to existing transmission, to the, so the cost to interconnect um, those new renewable power plants in that example um, to the you know, nearby high voltage substations, for example. Um, it also accounts for the cost of transmission um, so some regions where we assume transmission costs might be higher, um, it may actually prefer a lower quality renewable site um, where the transmission costs and distances may be lower uh, for the whole system um, uh, as a whole. So the, the latter part of the question is obviously some of the issues that were brought up um, about stability, for example, um, are outside of the resolution that the model could be able to capture. Um, so in those cases, um, ideally, as Jeff just noted, uh, we would then evaluate them with higher fidelity models to account for them. We do stop somewhere within the National Transmission Planning Study. We do look at hourly production cost modeling um, and some of the DC contingency analysis that Hamodi referred to, um, but some of the, uh, the higher resolution modeling that necessitates a full um, look at reliability would, would require more work. Thanks. Thank you. There were a lot of questions in there, so I appreciate you covering all of that. Uh, this question is for Jeff. Does C page calculate AC power flow as a snapshot or as it continues where generator parameters and transition from one generator state to another is included as a constraint? Yeah, thank you for the follow up question. So the, the C page tool is is basically extracting snapshots from the production cost model. It is the in the production cost modeling framework itself that uh, we're, we're looking at the characteristics of the generation constraints. So any sort of uh, ramping issues, if there's a uh, hydro um, in terms of uh, run river uh, issues, if there's any other things that uh, the um, hourly production cost model needs to include to make sure that from one hour to the next, we're being consistent and reflecting all of the generation constraints that's handled in the production cost model. Then what we're doing with CPage is we're taking those hourly snapshots and we're extracting that in order to conduct the, the power flow analysis. Um, it's, it's interesting that in, in looking at the stress cases and the resilience analysis in the power flow um, analysis domain, we need to take several different times uh, throughout the, the, the year to really look at when uh, the transmission stresses are gonna be um, uh, you know, creating uh, constraints when we do the contingency analysis. So it's a little bit different than the, the old days where we would just uh, sort of focus on peak hours and, and things like that. Because a lot of times um, peak load isn't necessarily when we have uh, maximum transmission constraints. So we want to use the CPage tool to selectively pull out those hours uh, that, that look like uh, could have some transmission issues. And then we use the the results of the production cost model and then pull that out as a snapshot for cpage but we're relying on the production cost model to provide the consistency between um, the hours and making sure that all the constraints are modeled as it relates to the generation uh, thanks whitney for the question great thank you all right our next question is for carl um, is there a specific timing of a pacific offshore wind transmission study uh, great. That's a straightforward one. Um, so um, we kicked that effort off at DOE in uh, May of this year, and it's a 20-month study. Um, so that gives you a sense of when we think the project is going to be done. Um, so it's you know it's an effort. It's another kind of lab-based effort, um, just like we did on the east eastern seaboard. Um, and with that engagement, it will be around 20 months. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So this one is going to be for True and for Hamodi. I believe the first part will be for True, and then um, 
another part for Hamodi. So it seems that these transmission expansion model results focus highly on the implementation of 500 kilovolt lines. Is there a reason why 765 kilovolt, kilo, <laughs> kilovolt and HVDC lines are not considered? Are transmission voltage and conducting sizing also considered? And then the part that would be for Hamodi is are advanced conductors being used? Yeah, um, I'm happy to take this on behalf of True, uh, specifically as it relates to some of the nodal uh, models and nodal modeling efforts that have been underway. Specifically on different voltage levels, uh, we are able to and are expanding at all voltage levels from 230 kV above, so 230, 345, 500, and 765 kV. Specifically on conductor types and assumptions that are being made there. Um, earlier on during the course of the project timeline, we had made some queries with our technical review committees and more specifically the modeling subcommittee on the types of conductors and conductor arrangements. So at the different voltage levels, we are making very specific assumptions around the conductor bundling and different voltage level thermal transfer capabilities when then translating these zonal capacity expansion outcomes into these nodal models. So in summary, yes, different voltages and various um, conductor types are being considered. Um, in the maps that were shown specifically today, it's one of the scenarios that is an AC expansion scenario. So you will see a lot of AC expansion. There isn't necessarily a preference between different voltage levels. It's what is the most appropriate voltage level to then transfer the bulk amount of power on the transmission system to the demand hubs as to where it's needed. Um, in terms of HVDC, similarly, some of the further scenarios will start to explore HVDC and we'll hopefully be able to present some of that in the near future. And I think Amodi was um, alluding to that once the round two capacity expansion model results uh, become available. Amodi, I'm sure maybe you want to then address the advanced conductors components, but hopefully that addresses the first two parts of that question. Sure, yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'll say on, on that first part again, you know, 500 kV versus 765 kV. Uh, I want to emphasize, right, we've done a particular nodal implementation because you have to do something in order to run the models and do the analysis. But um, what, what's much more important than any particular implementation we're choosing here is sort of the comparative work between different scenarios. So, how does a system with a lot of interregional transmission perform? compared to a system with little or no interregional expansion, and whether that interregional expansion is implemented with 500 kV lines or 765 kV lines, you know, we, we would learn the same important lessons and demonstrate the same high value of interregional transmission e either way. So I just want to make sure to emphasize we're, we're not really advocating for one particular implementation in terms of another regarding voltage class. And then also regarding that, that piece of the question, uh, getting to advanced conductors. You know, uh, DOE is looking carefully and evaluating uh, grid enhancing technologies more broadly, and including advanced conductors as well as other technologies. And, and certainly those are important and we want to see them developed appropriately. Uh, you know, for, for this particular study, given its scope, uh, doing a deep dive into it to where it may be better to do advanced conductors uh, versus traditional uh, uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of the study. So certainly the, the particular implementations we're showing here, if we move further down the development pipeline into a more detailed plan of service, and it looks like actually this is an appropriate and good application for advanced conductors, then certainly, you know, we would support that. Uh, just that's a little bit further along in the more detailed uh, development of plan of service that's kind of outside of our scope. But, but again, it gets back to the idea that the particular implementations we're showing here aren't meant by any means to be final, and they could certainly be revised. So. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, so we've got time for one more question, and this is going to be for NREL here. What capacity expansion model was used? And is round two capacity expansion done with reads or a different model? And how were these 134 study zones developed? And I'm happy to re-ask any of those because it was three questions in a row. 
No, I think I got it, Whitney. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the REEDS model, uh, NREL's regional energy deployment system model was used for the capacity expansion for both round one and round two. Um, however, round two, we've had uh, made some fundamental improvements to the model that um, Carl summarized briefly, including improving its temporal resolution, um, updating the policies and technology uh, projections, um, improving our reflection of transmission, both at the interconnection um, kind of sub zone level as well as kind of our costs um, in, in terms of long long distance transmission lines and improving our assumptions about siting renewables where you could put them uh, among many other changes that are kind of fundamental um, so uh, we are still using the same model the spatial resolution is the same um, the 134 zones were allocated um, depending on a bunch of factors including regulatory factors we have to conform to state boundaries um, we do have a sophisticated method um, to discuss how we calculate the interface uh, existing interface transfer limits between zones and whatnot that I'm happy to follow up with those who are interested in those technical details. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there, but of course we could go on with many more uh, technical discussion. Thank you so much, True, and thank you, Hamodi, Carl, Jeff, Jared, everyone who was participating there in that uh, great Q&A session, and thank you for all your questions that you all have submitted. So that wraps up our questions for today's webinar. So if you have any comments or questions on the National Transmission Planning Study, you can email us at ntpstudy at hq.doe.gov. That is also there in the chat. And a copy of today's slides will be available on this webinar's landing page by this Friday, and the recording will be available in about two weeks. We will send you an email when all of that is available. Um, and you can find a link to the landing page in the chat now. Again, thank you to Jeff Hamodi, Carl, Alyssa, PNNL, and NREL for joining us today and leading us through this wonderful webinar. And thank you to all of our attendees for participating. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next time.